And uh, well, that's a good question. It's a fair question. And then I'd ask you, not only have you told anybody about the Lord, but have you prayed for anybody to know the Lord this week? Have you asked God to give you opportunities to witness to people this week? That is some serious, fair questions. Then I'd ask you this question. What have you read in your Bible and studied in your Bible this week? And uh, Brother Johnny came in and told me, he said, Pastor, he said, I, I, I've got that one short verse down over there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 7. And he, he did a good job quoting it to me. He said, I'm having a hard time with that long one, but he said, I, I at least got the short one. And, and so uh, then we're going to listen to him quote that Sunday. And I hope some of y'all have been working on your verses and have got them down to where um, we can quote our verses Sunday if you've not quoted them yet this month. And uh, so what are you reading? What are you studying? And uh, I've been reading through my New Testament. I read through my New Testament a lot. Now I read through my Old Testament also, but uh, I've been reading in my New Testament. Yesterday I was in 1 Peter. I read 1 Peter and I read over it about three times and, and meditated on 1 Peter and on the, the idea of holiness and uh, be holy in all manner of conversation. I hope you read the devotions. I try to send out a devotion every few days. Hope you read those. Uh, I text them to you. If you don't read them, it, they, they can be a real encouragement, I hope. And uh, But, you know, I dealt with the idea of that God has, uh, first of all, exhorted us to holiness. Be holy in all manner of conversation. Then he educates us on those two manners of conversation, our spiritual conversation, and then he deals with our societal conversation. A, a holy priesthood, spiritual, and holy nation, society. And then he shows us some things about the examples. And uh, he showed us the holy worker, Christ himself, and he showed us the holy women. Amen. I wondered why he didn't say holy men, but he does deal with holy men of God in chapter in 2 uh, Peter as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And, and we're looking at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 1. We want to give us a quick overview of 2 Peter tonight. And uh, just um, how, and, and, and so in 2 Peter chapter 1, Three in verse number one, he makes this statement. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the, by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lust. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are, are, they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were, were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world and that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved in fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, so many count slackness, but is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Our Father, thank you for thy word. Let it be a lamp on our feet and a light on our path, and we'll thank
thank you for what you do in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So I want us to see some things about 2 Peter. First of all, he tells us to whom he is writing in 2 Peter in chapter 3 and verse number 1. He lets it be known that he is, he is writing to the saints. Two things that let us know this. Number one, he is writing to those uh, who are beloved. And then he is writing to those who have a pure heart. Those who are beloved and have a pure heart. That is to the saints. He says that to them that have obtained a like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That's how he tells us in chapter 1 and verse number 1. But two things he, we understand. So he's writing to the church folks. Those who... Number one are the beloved of God that have obtained a like precious faith. And number two, they have a pure mind. They are those who are desiring to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I would say this, that if you say you're a saint and you do have no desire to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, you might be an ain't. I didn't say for certain you are. There might be something going on and you might be going through some struggles at this point in time in your life and you might be discouraged, you might be distraught, you might be distant at this moment and might be a saint. But if you don't have any desire for God, you ought to examine yourself and see if you can be in the faith. Are you a saint or are you an ain't? These ones he was writing to were the ones who showed up to listen to the letter and to listen to this letter being written. So he is writing it to the saints and he is writing for their stirring. You'll notice that he tells us, both which I stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance. And so 1 Peter teaches us, uh, uh, 1 Peter teaches us to gird up the loins of our mind. And now he's saying, I'm going to stir up what you gird up. He tells us to protect our minds in chapter 1 and verse 13 of 1 Peter. But now in 2 Peter, he's saying, I'm going to stir up those pure minds. I want these things to be stirred up by, in, in, for, by a couple of ways. And I want you to see the two ways he wants our minds to be stirred. Number one, he wants to stir us up by remembrance of some things. By remembrance. And you'll see that in verses 2 through 7, that, and that, that to be mindful of the words which were spoken by the, the holy prophets and by the, of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. And you'll find that he says, I want to stir you up by remembrance. There's some things you ought to remember. And then he says, I want to stir you up by reminding you of some things. In verse number 8 of chapter 3, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that a day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now some people want to take that and say, well see, uh, God does things, he, he doesn't, he, he, if it's a day, the Lord is a thousand years, and so they say, well, you can see how the, uh, uh, evolution could have happened because God says a day and he means a thousand years. Can I say, oh, God's trying to tell you in this portion of scriptures, be patient. Be patient. I want to remind you of some things. And God knows what he's doing and God is doing something. Be patient. He wants you to be reminded of some things. And the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. But as long as suffering does, we're not willing to issue prayers, but all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Be patient. The Lord's coming is at hand. And his judgment of the world is coming soon. Be patient. So he wants to stir us up by remembrance. And I want to look at some of this remembrance. He, matter of fact, he uses that word in chapter 1 
He uses that word three times telling them about this remembrance stuff. Uh, so in verse 11 he says, For the summoned entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it mean as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Knowing this, that shortly I must put off this tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. And so I want you to know two things that he wants us to remember that I found in this portion in, this, in the scriptures today. Number one, he wants us to remember the scripture. Chapter 3 and verse number 2 that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. Remember the Scripture. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now I use the word Scriptures because I'm using an S word, but the truth of the matter is, all the spoken or written word of God that was preached in days of old by the prophets and all that God has put down for us at this point in time in the word of God that we have right here in our King James Bible, we ought to remember the scriptures. And I always look at that. And then remember, there are scoffers. There are scoffers. Is that not what he tells us right there? There shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own love. I'm not just reminding you of this, but I want you to remember there are scoffers. I will let you know this about scoffers. They've always been. There were always scoffers. Did they not, in chapter 2 and verse number 5, we can see this. Did they not scoff at Noah? For God spared not the angel that sinned, but cast him down to hell, and delivered him out of the chains of darkness to be reserved in judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Did not for 500 years Noah preach righteousness? Did not for 500 years that Noah was uh, only eight souls were saved? Because why? They were scoffing him, mocking him, making fun of him. Why? It did not rain. And Noah was a preacher of righteousness and the righteous judgment of God. And being scoffed and mocked and ridiculed. And I will say this. They scoffed Lot. Lot came in there and did they not Say, who's this man? He comes in and makes his home around us here in Sodom. Who is this man? Now he wants to be a, a, a leader, a ruler. Now he thinks he's somebody. Did they not? The one who vexed his righteous soul. Matter of fact, the Bible even tells us, for this righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing, vexed, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. He allowed these things to be part of his life to uh, not partake of those unrighteous deeds, but looked at them upon them, saw them, and said nothing about them. And it vexed his righteous soul. And did they not scoff at him? I will tell you this, though. God prevailed. He prevailed. Even in Lot's situation. Or at least that's what he says. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and reserve the unjust 
to, uh, to the day of judgment to be punished. And did he not deliver the law? And we know he did. I am just trying to get you to understand some things. Remember, scoffers have always been. There's never been a time that there have not been scoffers. So remember that scoffers, we can remember their conduct of the scoffers. We can see that in chapter 3 and verse number 3. Knowing this first, that there shall be in the coming the last day scoffers walking after their own lust. You'll see them in chapter 2 in verse number 3. And through covetousness shall they with vain words make merchandise of you. They walk after their own lust. They're called in chapter 2 false prophets also among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you whose privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves with destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. He wants you to know to remember their scoffers. Remember the conduct of the scoffers. Remember the conversation of the scoffers. In chapter 3 and verse number 4 and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's all allegorical because he isn't coming soon. He's coming in spirit, but he's not coming in part. It was all, that's what they tell you. There's a group out there that tries to allegorize the Bible and make it just a book on how to live right. And they don't even really believe in a literal return of the Lord. You say, I don't believe that. I got saved in an independent Baptist church. A man that taught me, took me out knocking doors, witnessing the people, took me to some, uh, I mean, taught, brought me to jail, to preach in jail, got me started in jail ministry. I mean, this man, and got me and opened up the door for my first prison ministry that I had that was part of, that was my ministry that I was, years later, I find out that this man believes everything in the Bible is out of the world. He was a Bible literalist before, but because of something that happened in his life, and he became educated, educated beyond his intelligence, and quit believing the Word of God to be the Word of God in truth, he started trying to figure it out. Now, let me say, I have not a no problem studying. Matter of fact, I'll get to that. But the truth of the matter is, you need to study by the place of believing it means what it says and says what it means. Their conversation. They're going to say, Where is the promise of the coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Is that not? I mean, it just happened. There's no real God who cares about us. Even if there is a God that created things, because they believe in intelligence of creation. They're not the they're not the uh, the evolutionists. There's the crowd out there. They believe in it. But they believe in creation in such a way that it really isn't creation. They believe in evolutionary creation. I mean they believe in all these they got these ideas and they say because God just started the thing and then he sits back. He started maybe with the big bang. I don't know. I mean they said they, they'll tell you this. And he doesn't care about us. He's just sitting back if he even exists. They'll scoff at you. Do you not believe that they did that in 2 Kings chapter 5? They scoffed and scoffed and scoffed. I think it's chapter 5. Where it, it, uh, Elijah was at. And Elijah turned around and said, okay. Let's do it by fire. See who which God. And then you know what he did? He turned around and scoffed at them. Where's your God at? Is he taking a break? What, what's he doing? Why can't he do it? 
He put his faith in the fact that God had called him and told him to be there and God was going to do the work. Remember, there's scoffers. There's always been scoffers. And remember, the scoffers, their conduct, their conversation, and their choice. They're willingly ignorant. They don't have to be ignorant. The Bible says they are willingly are ignorant. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old. That God said, let there be light. And there was light. They just won't believe. And so they say, I've got, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to make fun of you for believing. And I'll just tell you this. I cannot prove there's a God. I don't have to. I cannot prove creation. I don't have to. I will tell you right up front. It's by faith. I believe it. Now let me tell you this. They can't prove that there's not a God. And so when they tell me prove there's a God, I said, burn proofs on you. You want to say there is one? Prove it. Prove me there's not a God. Then they'll say, you know, then they'll get on that creation thing. They'll sit there and say, well, I believe in evolution. I said, prove that. I saw a guy the other day said, Well, your mama, does she look like a chimpanzee? Your grandma look like an ape? The guy that he said that to him started getting upset. Why? Was it your great-grandma? Was she the one who's a, huh? Gorilla woman. I mean, he didn't say it. I mean, but he just said, what are you getting upset about? You really believe that? Tell me how far back your ancestry was. You really believe you came from an They don't. It just sounds like they're trying to get rid of God. Because that's what they want to do is get rid of God. Because God wrote his law in their hearts. And so don't scoff at you for being a Bible believer. He said, I want you to remember that they're scoffers. And I want you to remember the scriptures. Remember the scriptures. The word of God. Chapter 1 and verse number 16 he says, We have not followed cunning to devise fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were our eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came with such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And when he goes on to say, We have a more sure word of prophecy, where until you do well to take heed, as unto the light shineth. In a dark place until the day dawn and the day starts rising your heart. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Remember the scriptures? God gave us the scriptures. He gave us the word of creation. In verse number uh, 5 of chapter 3, our, he, said, he said, By the word of God the heavens were of old in the earth, standing out of the water and in the water. God caused the dry land to appear. God did that by his word. Not only did he do that, but he gave us a word of not of just of creation, but he gives a word of judgment. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. God says judgment is coming. He said it in His Word. If you read the book of Genesis, this all happened. Remember the scriptures. And in the word of continuance. And the world that then was, and then He goes on, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved under the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. God will bring judgment. And it's going to come by fire. Remember 
They're scoffers. Remember the scriptures. Because there's going to be, always has been, and always will be scoffers. There always has been, and there always will be the word of God. It's settled in heaven. And the scriptures always will prevail. Always. Because there's always a Savior. So he's then starting to remember, he's starting to remind her. And he reminds her of some things. He said, I'm putting you in remembrance of some things, I'm reminding you of some things. The scoffers always tell lies. They promise things. Matter of fact, in chapter 2, I believe it is, um, he said, while they promised him liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, verse 19. I mean, they great speak great swelling words of vanity. They allure them through the lust of the flesh, through the much wantonness, those that were unclean escape from them who live in error. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For if whom a man is overcome, same as, for if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse than the beginning. For it is better for them to not have known the right way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But as it has happened unto them, according to true proverb, now I, I, I love this proverb, chapter 26 of Proverbs, verse number 11. But it says, The dog is turned to his own vomit, and the sow that is washed in her wallowing in, to her wallowing in the mire. You'll notice. Neither one of them became a new creature. The dog returned to his vomit. If you stayed a dog and never became a new creature, no wonder you returned to your vomit. You're just a dog that cleaned yourself up or a hog that cleaned yourself up. Now I'm just telling you, that's what he says. The dog returns to his vomit. And I've seen enough dogs do that. And I've seen hogs water in the mire. They do that. And let me say, every one of us has a dog-like old nature and a hog-like old nature. But we've got a new nature, hallelujah. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. They promise, promise lies. The scoffers, the false promise, the false teacher. They tell you liberty, but they're themselves in service of corruption. They can't even keep themselves straight. The Lord promises life. Chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, tells us where by our given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these they might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world through lust. I mean, he tells us, uh, verse number 10 of chapter 1, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. I mean, he just keeps on giving us these truths, these promises of life. Chapter six, or chapter 1, verse number 16, he says, uh, For we have not followed cunning devised faith. I mean, he just goes on and says, Listen, we have given you words of life. The scoffers will continuously give you life. They'll keep on telling you you can do this and you can work this up and you can accomplish this. And he keeps saying, God gives you, makes you a partaker of a divine nature. God does this. We've not followed cunning and devised fables. We don't have some rules and regulations or something that's going to make you a miraculous work. We got a God who will do a miraculous work. So he tells them, I'm going to remind you. I want to remind you that the world is going to face judgment. Chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, he tells us this. But the day of the Lord.